Hello and welcome to the Tennis Podcast. This is your host, Nick. I'm Brandon. That's my sidekick host, Brandon. Oh, sidekick. And this is a very special edition of the Tennis Podcast. Before I tell you why, Brandon, I want to know what are your plans for Xmas? Christmas? And I'm not talking about the website you visit. I'm talking <laughs> about Christmas. I don't have any spectacularly exciting plans. It's all centered around children now and what makes children happy. Ugh. No, our, we stay in town, our family lives here or is coming here. It's literally not worth wasting another uh, minute or second of anyone's time on. Well, Brandon, I don't know if you know this, but people listen to our podcast for entertainment, not to be bored to death, so you should embellish or make up a story next time. We'll work on that. Every Christmas Eve, we've started a new tradition. Uh, we go out and kill a hobo with a hammer. Is it Bill Belichick? <laughs> It's not Bill Belichick, but they have all been say, been wearing the same t-shirt and short and hoodie onesie combos. Rompers. Yeah, rompers. You you and your uh, family aren't going to recreate the nativity scene at your house for Christmas Day? I guess I technically recreate the nat- nativity scene a few times every day with my infant son squealing and kicking in my arms while I try to feed him. I have to imagine that baby Jesus wasn't always... Like, I'm sure he's always pictured as tranquil and sweet, but if he was a real baby, sometimes he would have, you know, (laughs) sometimes he might have shit up his back and missed a couple naps and just made everybody miserable. Yeah, and back then, there's not, you know, the diaper and wipe technology that exists today. I was actually thinking about that earlier. It's much more annoying back then than it is now, and it's still very annoying now. Had a shit up of the back situation earlier, and I had wipes at at my disposal and and, uh, a can with a lid on it to trap the scent of uh, of dirty things and even a changing pad that's specially made to be able to wipe clean very easily and I thought if because I'm playing uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, There it is. Okay. Everyone take a shot. I keep thinking about what people would have done in cowboy times in any situation and there, if you had a baby, you would have just have sh- had shit all over yourself and all over the baby 100% of the time. If you had a baby, you'd just leave it by itself until it got pneumonia and died while you were out uh, forcing yourself upon a hooker. They don't, you can't force yourself on hookers in Red Dead Redemption, but you can uh, be forced upon by a grizzly bear. All right, I asked if you were recreating the nativity scene. I think you should recreate the shut the hell up scene now before I get upset. Okay. Brandon, this is our Christmas episode yes. of the Tennis Podcast. A holiday episode. Yes. Excuse me. I don't want to offend anyone. Well, holiday episode. I, that's something I actually wanted to address. All right. Go ahead. Well, you did say uh, Christmas movies when you were telling me to do, you know, for my, put my list together, put my research together for this. Uh, you mentioned Christmas movies, but I thought about Hanukkah. This is also the time when... Millions of Americans celebrate Hanukkah and the only Hanukkah movie that I am aware of is the animated Adam Sandler movie, Eight Crazy Nights. Don't you think this is a big opportunity for someone to create a classic Hanukkah movie? Or the market is prepared for it, sounds like. Yeah. So, if somebody made The White Christmas or the... How the, how the, how the Pinch Stole Hanukkah. <laughs> just just take an idea and slap Hanukkah on it. <laughs> yeah, if they had a How the Grinch Stole Christmas idea for Hanukkah or if they had a Miracle on 34th Street version, I feel like this is a is a is this is some low-hanging fruit, some plump low-hanging fruit plump that has not yet been picked. Some president-shaped <laughs> low-hanging fruit that has not yet been picked. He would be an orange. Let me explain how this week's show is going to work. It's our first ever opinion-based top 10 list. In our previous 17 episodes, every list we've done have been based on research and evidence and facts. Sometimes. So, instead of telling you our favorite horror films, we told you the highest grossing horror films. Uh, That was episode 5. This week, we are going to be offering our opinions, which is something we're going to do every once in a while, but still not very often. Brandon has his list of five Christmas slash maybe Hanukkah movies. I have my list of five and we're going to guess each other's list. But Brandon, we haven't talked about this till now, but I don't want you to reveal your ranking until the end. Okay. While we're guessing, we're just going to say yes or no, it's in your top five. Okay. All right. Uh, and before we start, I got to say uh, quickly, of all the ideas we've done so far, 
even though Christmas is not my favorite holiday, this has been my favorite list to put together. I'm very excited for this. Everyone write that down so you can remember that tomorrow that this was Baron's favorite list. Well, maybe you can... That's generating excitement. If I'm going to be excited, then it's going to come through and people are going to be more excited to hear about it. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's excited that the sidekick host is excited about his list on this podcast. I'm not a sidekick. Okay, but before we dive in, cool. last week we put up on our social media accounts asking for people to share their favorite. Christmas movies. Yep. And we're going to start by reading those actually before we get into ours. Mm -hmm. So, I asked this on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts you can follow us at Tennis Pod. And I'm going to read some of those. So, first, let's start with Twitter. No Better Death on Twitter, which uh, they have a great podcast that I really enjoy about historical deaths throughout history. Ooh. It's actually a really good podcast. Recommend it. No Better Death, uh, here, here was their comment. I'm just going to read it verbatim. Being the gothy death guy, I should probably have a Christmas horror movie to cite, but the only Christmas movie I voluntarily watch is Christmas with the Cranks. <laughs> <laughs> Something about a guy being like, fuck all y'all, I'm doing me, followed by the whole street hating him that I can really relate to. At no better death, numeral one at Twitter. Well, that's exactly what he did with his Christmas film choice. He said, F what everybody else thinks, I'm doing Christmas with the Cranks. I've not seen Christmas with the Cranks. I haven't either. I know about I, it. I got it as a gift one year and it's sitting in my closet but I've never watched it. You should get it out and watch it. Well, I'm going to. to you know, find out what this guy's excitement's all about. All right, I'm going to read some more from Twitter. This is from Kentifer12 at Twitter. Sounds like a real nerd. Uh, his favorite Christmas movie is How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the Jim Carrey version. Whoa. Uh, my kid has seen the uh, cartoon, he's, he's five, uh, he's seen the cartoon version like most kids have but the other day I flipped around the channels and uh, uh, no, it's on Netflix so the trailer played for the humanized, <laughs> the live action, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas and he was terrified. He thought it looked scary as hell and I had, had to agree. Did you tell him to man up? No, we both quickly changed it. We were both... We both got the uh, well, the creepy crawly story. There's a scene that Kentifer 12 and me both love in that movie, which is when Jim Carrey's The Grinch is sitting in his lair, like going through his to-do list for the day. Have you seen this movie semi-recently? No, but you've told me about this part before. Well, he's going through things and this is the best scene in the movie. He's going through his schedule and he says, at five o'clock, I got to sol solve world hunger. And then as an aside, he says, tell no one. <laughs> so, he wants to solve world hunger and then tell no one just to be a jerk. It's a very grinchy thing to do. All right. One more from Twitter is from at Tosh Mifun, numeral one. It's a Wonderful Life. Says, it's their number one movie of all time. They cry every time they watch it. Seen it over 100 times. And uh, they have a podcast that they want to give a shout out to at Half Hill Report. At Half Hill Report, that's their podcast. It's a Wonderful Life. Brandon, is that on your list? It is not on my list. I don't have any like issues with The Wonderful Life. I think it's nice to have on in the background, but I can't say that I've ever sat through the entire thing. Having seen the ending so many times in other forms of media, it sort of ruined the movie for it where it seems like I'm just waiting for the two or three parts of the movie I've seen a thousand times. Oh, I will say one of the best iterations of those It's a Wonderful Life clips showing up in other media it was on Conan O'Brien. They, uh, uh, when he was still doing Late Night, they borrowed John Tesh's NBA on NBC theme. Uh, do, I don't know if you remember that. Are we, are we allowed uh, in, in post to insert the, the audio of something like that on here? Uh, but it's the scene in a Wonder It's a Wonderful Life where he's on the bridge and thinking about jumping, and then the old raggedy bum-looking angel, Clarence, I think his name is, uh, jumps into the, the icy waters off of the bridge ahead of him, and Jimmy Stewart's character rips off his jacket to jump in the water and save him. Cue the music. Now, everyone would have just giggled themselves silly remembering him, Jimmy Stewart's character, diving in the character to rescue Clarence to the soundtrack that we just played. 
All right, I'm going to read a few more and then we'll move on here. We're moving over to Instagram at Tennis Pod and Litflix Abby, who is the co host of the Litflix podcast, a show about all of your favorite books that became movies. Uh, her favorite Christmas movie is Home Alone. She says, It's funny, the house looks like Christmas threw up on it. Plus, Catherine O'Hara and John Candy, come on, you can't do better than that. I fully agree with her for all of those exact points. Is it on your list? Don't tell me. It's not on my list. Huh, okay. All right, Crime Aficionado says, A Christmas Story. It's their absolute favorite, closely followed by Christmas Vacation. And The Ref. And I've actually never seen The Ref. I didn't realize The Ref was a Christmas film. I've never, I, I, I have not, I haven't seen it since it came out. So, I remember none of it. But I know it has Dennis Leary in it and I like Dennis Leary. I just didn't remember that it was a Christmas film. Is Dennis Leary the one that went on to win five Super Bowl championships on the Patriots with Bill Belichick? <laughs> okay, Clear Your History podcast, their favorite is Die Hard, Ho 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 Motherfucker. Die Hard, that's my guess for your number one, but don't answer that yet. The More You Know Co, a great podcast that I was a guest on uh, and that's The More You Know Co, No Co as in Northern Colorado, so N-O-C-O. Tim Allen's The Santa Claus, he says, it's enjoyable, nostalgic, plus if you haven't seen it since you've been an adult, there are so many small adult references that add a lot to the movie. Sorry, I'm making notes about all the podcasts that I'm going to check out. And last one from Instagram. <laughs> so what? Sorry, that's really what I was doing. It's like, oh, he's I got No Better Death podcast on here and I'm going to check out this uh, this other one that you did an interview on. I want to make sure you didn't talk about me. I didn't want to make sure you didn't tell any more hot dog related <clears throat> lies. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, when Animals Attack podcast, their favorite is Silent Night, Deadly Night, which I've also not seen. I'm learning that I'm <laughs> maybe not as well versed in Christmas movies. You know, when I see a Christmas movie trailer like in the movies, that's not the type of movie where I'm like, oh, I need to go out of my way to see that one. No. You know? It, the Christmas movie market is flooded. My wife has gotten into watching the um, Lifetime or is it Lifetime or Hallmark Christmas movies and they're really, they suck. They're all, she admits that they're terrible. They're not good movies. But there is, they are fascinating in the way that they assembly line put these together, fascinating in, in how they must feel and who they must think their audience is and what level of stupid bullshit that they're able to buy and just roll with. Bad accents, bad acting, uh, much like the house in Home Alone, they look like Christmas threw up all over a Christmas postcard. Anyway, they're in very interesting, but, ju but counting all of those two, the Christmas market is more flooded than reality shows in the mid 2000s. Christmas time when it comes around, I also don't go out of my way to relive my favorite Christmas movies. I don't know. I'm just not a huge Christmas spirit guy. I will say that all of the movies on my list, uh, except, well, three of the movies on my list, I would watch uh, at any time of year if they, if they was flipping around the channels and saw them, I'd probably put them on the background. Two of them I watch at least every couple years and it doesn't matter if it's around Christmas or not. Although, it is a good reminder. Well, I'm going to guess the shit out of your list. I guarantee it. I know my Brandon. All right, let's wrap these up here. I'm going to move over to Facebook at Tennis Pod and uh, Joey, his favorite, he has three. A Christmas Story with Close Runners Up, Elf yeah. and Christmas Vacation. All good choices. He likes the yucks. Yes. He's going for Christmas yucks. Yeah, who watches a Christmas movie not for yucks? Well, if you watch It's a Wonderful Life, you're not watching it for yucks. You're watching it for... A, sadness? Yeah, I guess a lot of sadness and then like a rejuvenation of spirit. Right. Uh, Camille on Facebook, her favorite movie is Garfield Christmas. It's her family tradition. She also mentions... <laughs> I love that one. I would hate to sit... I don't know. Maybe I would enjoy sitting through Garfield Christmas. I'll, I might check it out. Well, Camille Brandon uh, burst. He had an outburst of abrupt laughter at the idea <laughs> of that being your family's tradition. So, kudos to you for that. Uh, Camille also mentioned the Santa Claus. That's our second Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. So, that's it. Those are great. 
I love those. I'm glad you asked that. Thank you, everybody who replied. Yeah, except uh, Camille. So, we will be... Uh, I sent one in. I don't remember seeing yours. I sent one in just this morning. I replied to the Instagram post. I got to go look now because I don't remember seeing that. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right, we got one more from Instagram, people. Brandon, his uh, answer was... <laughs> do you want to say it? I don't remember exactly. How the butt stole... <laughs> It was done for an audience of one. How the butt stole Christmas. <laughs> he knows me. How did it do that? All right, people, let's get to the list. Brandon, mm-hmm. I have a list of movies that I suspect are on nobody's list. Okay. Tell the them. Santa Claus 3, The Escape Clause, star, co-starring Martin Short as an evil Jack Frost. <laughs> I didn't know that existed, but it's not. It's a battle of Christmas. There's two reasons to enjoy a movie. Because it's really good or because it's really shit. And that one sounds like real shit and I would probably watch it. Yeah. Critics, uh, I think I got like a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Home Alone 4, Taking Back the House. Starring a different kid, Yes, right? 2002 TV movie. Oh, The no. only thing notable here, one of the bad guys, because there's always two or three bad guys breaking in this kid's house. Uh, one of them was French Stewart of Third Rock from the Sun fame. Oh, that's the guy, he squints a lot. Good guy. I'm going to say that this year's uh, 2018's version of The Grinch starring Benedict Cumberpatch is not on anyone's top list. Maybe a few kids out there. I guess I don't see the point of remaking. You don't see the point, really. Cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess artistically I don't see the point in <laughs> recreating a cartoon with a, like a 3D cartoon. The animation looks fun. It doesn't have to be dressed up with a third dimension. <laughs> How the butt stole Christmas. Yeah, I've had enough of the third dimension. Every day in the third and fourth dimension of real life sucks. Give us something easy. Take away a couple dimensions and make something that looks kind of So, you fun. like the flat animated style. So, you don't like Pixar films then? I, I strongly prefer two-dimensional cartoons and traditional cell animation or animation resembling cell animation to anything computer animated. Okay. Uh, I don't think Fred Claus starring Vince Vaughn is on anyone's list. I never saw it. It looked... Look, there's a middle area. There's movies that are really good. (laughs) There's movies that are really shit. And then there's a middle area where Fred, Fred Claus is right in the middle of it and... I just don't want to waste my time with something that's lukewarm like that. I mean, I'm a big Vince Vaughn fan, but he has a lot of misses along with his hits there. Uh, Another one is Jack Frost starring Michael Keaton where he becomes a snowman. I was thinking about that movie this morning. It's not not considering it for my list, but uh, because I love Michael Keaton and he usually picks such like cool and interesting things, but becoming a humanoid snowman. (laughs) Was not one of them. To tug on your heartstrings. Uh, And also the horror film, Jack Frost. Remember that? It was a killer snowman. No. Is it also starring Martin Lawrence as Jack Frost? (laughs) Martin Lawrence. (laughs) Is that what you said earlier? The bad guy in... um... Martin Short. Did I say Martin Lawrence? I meant Martin Short if I said that. Maybe you said Martin Lawrence and I... Or said Martin Short and I thought Martin Lawrence. If you said Martin Short and I would have realized that at the time... I love Martin Short, so that maybe I need to add a different. What movie was this we were talking about? Santa Claus Three: The Battle Between Santa and Jack Frost. I didn't know that was Martin Short, and my opinion is completely yeah. I want to well, see when it you even see more the poster there. and you see Martin Short's ridiculous face. That's either going to in- intensify your urges to watch it. It will intensify. My pants are going to be on fire. I got fiery pants for Martin Short. Uh, Santa Claus 3, I'm adding it to my notes. All right, one more. These movies, that's on nobody's list. A Medea Christmas. The Medea train passed me by. I saw it in the distance. She's like a, kind of a version of Ernest in that she keeps going. Every movie is a different adventure, right? She's gone to prison like Ernest went to prison. Yeah, is there an Ernest Christmas? That should have been on my list. Ernest Saves Christmas is one of one of his first Ernest movies. You know, there's a podcast out there that I haven't listened to, but it's on my list where they just go through every Ernest movie. Yeah, we should have done that. <laughs> it's not too late. Let's see if I can find it. Give him a little shout out here. 
Yeah, The Importance of Seeing Ernest. That's really good. That is a podcast about three friends sitting together watching every Ernest program in chronological order. I love that idea. I'm going to be, I would be sad when they ran out of Ernest movies. Yeah. Sad because there's no more Ernest movies. Oh, is that why? Because he's dead. Is he dead? Jim Varney is dead. What happened yeah. to him? I don't know. I think he was ill. I don't, I don't know. Heroin overdose? I, I think he might have died. I could be wrong. Um, he might have died of cancer. Well, let's just spread that around. <laughs> I like to, I'm going to try to bring up as many uh, depressing things as I can in this Christmas episode. Where were we? Okay, so that's my list. Do you have any off the top of your head of Christmas movies that you're pretty certain would be on nobody's list besides how the butt stole Christmas? Lifetime or Hallmark Channel Christmas movies I mentioned earlier. Uh, I don't think any of those are anyone's favorite. And if they are, it could only be like the actor who got to star in it. <laughs> my f favorite mo Christmas movie is starring me. All right, let's get to the guessing here. Let's do it. Should we do it one at a time where like I guess your entire list and then you guess mine or do you want to go back no, and forth? No, let's, let's go back and forth right. and then at the end we can restate or recap. And just remember, don't reveal your rankings yet. All right, okay. I'm going to take the first guess and mm -hmm. I know this is on your top five and it might be number one, Die Hard. Die Hard is on my list. Die Hard is... I think roundly agreed to be a great movie. It has a 93% uh, rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It pulled in $83 million at the box office when it came out. Die Hard is, I, I've heard um, people who are wrong uh, argue that Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Die Hard takes place at Christmas and is at its core the story of a man uh, reconciling with his wife and reuniting with his family for Christmas after he murders a bunch of international terrorists slash thieves. Traditional Christmas. Uh, basically, anyone who doesn't like Die Hard is saying its depiction of a non-traditional Christmas is not to their liking. And it also has boobies in it. I'm going to make a confession. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Whatever. Confess. Let's hear it. I'm going to make a confession. It's going to put me on a lot of people's shit list. But I have to be honest. I'm an honest Do person. You? No one can take, you know, you say what you want about me. But in addition to being the better of the hosts for this podcast, you could also never take away that I'm an honest man. Mm -hmm. Haven't seen Die Hard. You're an idiot. I hear it's great. It makes... Almost any other action movie you've ever seen look as stupid as most of them are because it's incredibly well written. It has a rich and detailed story and detailed characters. It has attention to detail. There's little things in it that I'm still picking up having seen it like, like 30 years ago. I'm still picking things up. Uh, it touches on issues of race and feminism. It has Alan Rickman, who uh, you millennials know as, what's his name? Snape, the goth wizard. Alan Rick, one of Alan Rickman's many talents is playing a charming and funny and interesting, but also evil villain. And he is incredible in Die Hard. Hell of an ass, too. Do you remember when I said earlier that there are boobies in it? Sure. Christmas boobies. Let's hear it. Let's hear a description of it. Of the boobies? Anything and everything relating to these Christmas boobies. Someone opens a door to a room in the Christmas party and there's a couple fooling around in there and there's a lady with her top off. And then later on, uh, as John McClane is, uh, I think in like a maintenance uh, worker's office. And John McClane. Is that the one played by David Spade? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the, uh, in the, within the depths of the building, there's like, a, I think a maintenance worker's office where he's posted up some nudie pictures on the wall. So, for everyone who was 12 years old <laughs> and living 20 years ago, this is the way you kids can see boobies. And I, have, I got more boobies to come too. Okay, that's interesting. All right, guess my movie. 
Elf. Now, do you say that with disdain or, or understanding? I do not say elf with disdain. Elf is on my list. I knew it. Came out in 2003. Has a global box office of $220 million. Oh, you did global box office? Yeah, did you do domestic? You idiot. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, just go look them up while you're talking. It takes five seconds. The story is about one of Santa's elves, played by Will Ferrell, who learns he is actually a human and goes to New York City to meet his biological father, played by James Caan. 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 Spreading Christmas cheer in a world of cynics. It inspired the 2010 Broadway musical Elf the Musical and NBC's 2014 stop-motion animated television special Elf Buddy's Musical Christmas, which I didn't know either of those. Although it was fairly well-received when released, its reception has warmed over time and is now regarded strongly to be one of the greatest Christmas films ever made. Jesus Christ. When asked about a sequel... Since the first was so successful, Will Ferrell has stated numerous times he has no desire to reprise his role as Buddy Deal. No, please. Uh, no, no one will do that. Well, I don't know who owns like the rights to the characters or whatever, but John Favreau does not do stupid shit like that. He's the person who... Is anyone surprised that Brandon knew off the top of his head the, the fucking director for this 2003 Christmas film? I'm going to make you look like an idiot later. He would never do that and Will Ferrell, I don't think. Well, Will Ferrell's not above making a crappy sequel because he made Anchorman 2. Well, I actually enjoyed Anchorman 2, but he, I, I have seen an interview with Will Ferrell. I don't remember where, but he was like, I can't just keep making sequels to everything <laughs> because people were like, when is the Step Brothers 2 sequel coming out? Yeah, I don't want one of that. Just leave it alone and make a new movie. You could still have those two guys together in a movie. Well, they have a movie coming out this month. Yeah, and it looks like it's probably funny. I'll go, I'll check it out. All right, so that's Elf. Okay, that's Elf. All right, I'm going to guess another one of yours. Mm Mm-hmm. Jingle All the Way. I did consider it, but Jingle All the Way is not on my list. A Christmas Story. Christmas Story was strongly considered, but not included on the list. Christmas Vacation. Christmas Vacation is included on the list, mostly because it was written by John Hughes. Uh, I will say its rating, its rank in my heart, has fallen over the years because of it's so popular now that like on ugly Christmas sweaters that they make at Walmart or sell at Walmart, there are what I guess are supposed to be obscure quotes from the movie like, um, why is the carpet all wet, Todd? And they'll put that on a sweater. I still enjoy the movie. I think there are things that are still funny about the movie, but... It just seems like some of the things other people enjoy about it are not the same, are are things that maybe I think I'm a little tired of. Because I've been watching a lot since I was a kid. Tell me about the uh, Rotten Tomatoes score in box office. Rotten Tomatoes has not been kind to Christmas Vacation. It sits at 64% by critics. And Christmas Vacation, I guess, did not get a release outside of the U.S., brought in $71 million across the U.S. But I think it's probably made 10 times that on selling rights to play it on cable and Netflix and stuff. You want to guess another one of Nick's? I'm going to guess A Christmas Story. No. A Nightmare Before Christmas? No. And it is, isn't it The Nightmare Before Christmas? I don't know. I've never seen it. You haven't seen it? No. I've no, I, I know about it. Huh. I'm not... I'm f- that was one of my guesses for yours. I guess I just gave you a clue. I should have kept my mouth shut. The Santa Claus. Santa Claus is on my list. 
How do you feel about the Santa Claus, Brandon? I really like that it has Judge Reinhold in it. He plays the <sighs> stepdad. Okay. And he's a nice stepdad. He's a good guy. He's the one who gets the weenie whistle. Yeah, I know the weenie whistle. Well, you know that the real Judge Reinhold, the man, not the guy in the movie, uh -huh. he doesn't need a weenie whistle because he is an elite whistler. Why don't you explain to the folks at home what you mean by that? It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search for Judge Reinhold whistle, whistle, this man can whistle like a son of a bitch. I've never seen anybody whistle as well as him. I think he might have won whistling competitions. If you want to, if you want to know what good whistling's all about, Judge Reinhold will show you. And put, it's put no it on joke. your to-do list, people. Good whistling, what it's all about. Judge Reinhold. Good whistling. Well, the Santa Claus clever little title because it's got claws like claws in a contract, and then like claws like on a kitty cat. No. I thought, wait, I think I'm thinking of Santa Paws. Is there a movie called Santa Paws on your list? I, I'm going to just move on because I'm going to get upset. The Santa Claus came out in 1994. It is the first film in the Santa Claus film series starring Tim Allen as Scott Calvin, an ordinary man who accidentally causes Santa Claus to fall from his roof on Christmas Eve. When he and his young son Charlie finish St. Nick's trip and deliveries, they go to the North Pole where Scott learns that he must become the new Santa and convince those he loves that he is indeed Father Christmas. We have three nicknames for Santa in that reading I just gave. Santa Claus, Saint Nick, and Father Christmas. John Pasquin. This was his and Tim Allen's first movie collaboration. It was directed by him. After they both worked together on the TV series Home Improvement, which our listeners will recognize from episode 16 of the Tennis Podcast. Or from their life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they also worked together on the films Jungle to Jungle, Joe Somebody, and the television series, the really bad one, called Last Man Standing. He is, he bought, he bought into the Tim Allen brand, hardcore. By the way, the poster for the Santa Claus, which I'm looking at now, has mm -hmm. a big red suit wearing fat Tim Allen. And it says, Scott Calvin must become Santa. No ifs or ands, dot, 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 just one big but. Hey, what happened to the, the Santa Claus who fell off the roof and died? He died. Yeah, what happened to his body? Didn't it disappear? Oh, uh, what a cop out. They should have ate it. No, they should have had, well, they could have made two cool choices. Maybe necrophilia? No. Well, I mean, <laughs> I didn't think of that one, but maybe. Uh, they could have had some elves, some little coroner elves, like elves whose job is just to pick up a dead Santa's body. They could have had them come in like a little black, uh, a creepy looking sleigh and pick up his body. Or they could have had Tim Allen's character Scott Calvin and his son wrestle with the problem of how to dispose the body of an old naked man. Acid. In a, in a bathtub? After all these centuries, these millennia of Santa Claus going around with his big old sack to everyone's house, uh -huh. I think when his dead body's sitting in front of you, you take advantage and you take a good look right under Santa's big old sack. Am I right? <laughs> How is he able to fit so much in here? Well, by the way, you can stuff his body into the sack. You got a, you got a ready-made... Magic sack. You got a ready-made well, sack. That, yeah. That would have been a really good idea to stuff him in that sack. Santa Claus is the only person in the history of the world that comes with an accessory to hide his body in immediately. And... When you're making the rest of the rounds, all those kids that are on the naughty list just get a hand, uh, like a chunk off of dead Santa's body. So, uh, I mean, it's, better, it it's better than a lump of coal. I was going to say, we're switching it up from coal, you're getting a chunk of Santa. What do you do with the chunk? Eat it, <laughs> store it in your the freezer, thing put it on your mantle. With, same thing a kid does with a chunk of coal, they probably just stick it in their mouth. <laughs> Stick it in their ass if they were you, am I right? 
Mm. <laughs> okay, it's your turn to guess. Hang on, Santa Claus did a bo- global box office of 189.9 million. Ah, oh, damn. And a Rotten Tomato score of 74%. Compare that to the Santa Claus 3, <laughs> which had 17%. <laughs> Oh, 17 people probably oh, were like, how am I going to dog on something with Martin Short in it? <laughs> or Martin Lawrence, we're not, we're not totally sure. And he's blue. Martin Short's character is a blue man with an evil grin. All right, for the next Brandon guess, mm-hmm. did I already say Christmas Story? You did. How about It's a Wonderful Life? It's not on here. I'm getting down to the, to the bones here now. I uh, may have, should I throw out some uh, clues? Yeah, give me a clue. Well, I guess one. I'll, I'll give you one automatically because one of mine was also on your list. Is it Elf? It is Elf. Elf is on my list. You've covered a lot of it, but my notes on it that you didn't hit upon are that it features Bob Newhart, who's one of my f- like favorite comedians ever, and Bob Newhart like actually had a really Great, funny role in it. Who was he? He plays Buddy's dad. Oh, adoptive dad. The elf dad. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry. He's not his human dad, James Conn. Uh, he's Buddy's adopted elf dad. For those of you who are like too young to remember or don't like to watch old shit like I do, Bob Newhart uh, was and still is a comedian who used to make like, you know, comedy albums. He was a stand-up comedian. He made comedy albums and then he was on some really funny uh, sitcoms like New Heart or the Bob New Heart Show. He's still super funny and uh, I have as much, I have about as much respect for John Favreau as I've had for anybody that I've never met and another thing that John Favreau has done I respect is put Bob New Heart in that role. And that was my other note is all about John Favreau, all capital letters in my notes. Because Tell me what else this man has done because I don't know. Most people probably were introduced to John Favreau in the, 90, in the 1990s indie film Swingers, which John Favreau wrote and directed, starred John Favreau and Vince Vaughn, and it launched both of their careers. Another film that he made in the late 90s that's very close to the style of Swingers, if you like that, also stars John Favreau and Vince Vaughn. It's called Made, M-A-D-E. Also stars Puff Daddy, and I'm in. It's it's. I'm not kidding. It's it's in my top ten movies of all time. I love it. John Favreau started uh, the television show. It was a really great idea called Dinner for Five. Uh, then the other thing that he did that everybody who is currently enjoying the Marvel Cinematic Universe should thank him for is he directed the first Iron Man movie, which was also the first. It kicked off. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the Iron Man movie, like everything weighed, depended upon the success of this movie. And he put Robert Downey yeah. Jr., who at the time was uninsurable in it. And he focused on a character that most people were at the time completely unfamiliar with, other than like he's a man made of metal. So he kicked that thing off. Uh, he's currently helming the first Star Wars live action TV series. Uh, called The Mandalorian. And from what little we've learned about it, it looks amazing. Then the other thing he did uh, to come back to Elf, another amazing feat is he created a modern Christmas classic. You know, the market, like I said, the market is flooded with Christmas movies and most of them are very forgettable. But John Favreau made a movie that has, within a short amount of time, became a lot of people's favorite or one of their favorite Christmas movies that they watch every year. And kids can watch it, adults can watch it, and it's, it's one of those Christmas movies that has wide, long-lasting appeal. I think that's a pretty amazing thing to do. If you make one successful movie and it's a Christmas movie, you're set for life because people keep buying the DVDs mm-hmm. or paying for the rights to stream it. Same thing with like a Christmas song. If you can write a Christmas classic, it could be your only hit, but your grandchildren will still be rich. John Favreau has done a lot of impressive uh, things, but Elf may be 
one of the most impressive in that it's a modern Christmas classic. Uh, well, I think Iron Man launching the Mar- the Marvel Universe franchise is also up there with... A multi-billion dollar franchise? You know, let's give credit to Will Ferrell too. You can't make that movie without someone who can be funny but also sweet and innocent and not have it seem like bullshit and get boring. He was all in on that character too. I can agree with you that Die Hard is a Christmas movie even though I haven't seen it. But if it's centered around Christmas, sounds like a Christmas movie to me. But to play devil's advocate to, for people that would say it's not a Christmas movie, maybe the argument there is what you were saying, where you were saying, if you make a Christmas movie, you're set for life because people will play it every year for Christmas time, et cetera, et cetera. Die Hard might not fall into that category of something that people think of for Christmas time. And its, it's success isn't based on its idea of Christmas. You know, it's, no, it's not. Its success is based on something else. So. If, you, if there was an argument that it's not a Christmas movie, that might be it. Well, and I'm not taking a stand on that. Yeah, good points. Solid points, but I wanna, I'm going to like it for Christmas and uh, I'm going to do it. So, suck it. Elf was on your list. So, let's go back Elf to was my list. Elf. Yeah. What, what do you think is on mine? Well, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the live action version. No. How about the cartoon version? I prefer no. the, cart- the original cartoon from 1967. Yeah. Is my favorite version of the Grinch and the only the, version of the Grinch on my list. The animation is done by Chuck Jones. And if you you may remember, you and I went to didn't we go to the Chuck Jones uh, Museum in San Diego? Oh yeah, we did. I yeah, I forgot about that. Chuck Chuck Jones, uh, a lot of people uh may not recognize his name, but you definitely recognize his art. He was one of the animators for Looney Tunes during the classic Looney Tunes you remember. Chuck Jones probably drew them. But does that mean he drew the originals? He didn't like literally draw every episode that they Yeah, I don't know that it means he drew every single cell, but the character design and probably a lot of the animation within the movie he did. But I mean, it's all based on Dr. Seuss's drawings too. It's based on Dr. Seuss, but you can clearly see Chuck Jones' influence. Chuck Jones' characters to me are, are always recognizable by their smiles. They tend to have... They tend to show plump cheeks. So, the second time you've used plump, by the way. <laughs> they do. They show plump, kind of rosy cheeks at the sides of the smiles and I th- it's one of the more recognizable parts of his drawings. But I'm surprised that the, sh- the things he's worked on, the Looney Tunes and the Grinch, they allow the plump butt cheeks to be focused on. <laughs> My favorite part of How the Grinch Stole Christmas is... He's going around and stealing all the Christmas stuff and it's when he slithers like a snake Mm -hmm. among the presents with that smile on his face. So, The Grinch, for the six people out in the world that haven't seen it, it's based on the 1957 book of the same name by Dr. Seuss. The the film came out in 1967. It's a TV only film. Tells the story of The Grinch trying to take away Christmas from the townsfolk of Whoville below his mountain hideaway. It was originally telecast in the United States on CBS on December 18th, 1966. It went on to become a perennial holiday special. And here's a fun fact that I know you already know, I'm sure, but for some reason this never hit home with me until I read it today. And that is that the film is narrated by and the Grinch is voiced by Boris Karloff, who, yeah. who played Frankenstein's monster and other things uh, from that classic horror era. I've seen this movie a million times and for some reason that never occurred to me that that was him and I just never paid attention to the credits or whatever but never never realized that. They do put Boris Karloff's name pretty large in the credits. Um, yeah, he does a cool job of that and something else that's interesting, I, I cannot remember his name off the uh, top of my head but uh, the guy who sings, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, uh-huh. also did the voice of Tony the Tiger. That is a fun fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Boris Karloff died, uh, I think, less than two years after The Grinch came out as well. Killed him. Well, no, his heart heart grew by three sizes and that's an extremely serious disease to have, an enlarged heart. Yeah, that's that's one take. But it also could be that the the role, the dark, sinister role of The Grinch (laughs) took such a toll on Boris, like the Joker took a toll on Heath Ledger. He probably died on Christmas. Would you say that the Grinch story slash character, where does he rank on like most iconic slash famous slash well-known Christmas, you know, things? Is he above Rudolph? Is he above Frosty? 
on like recognizability or yeah yeah i think he is because there's a lot of iterations of rudolph and i realize like yeah if you're going to put up a christmas decoration most people want to put up rudolph or frosty but frosty what frosty's a hack frosty sucks it's so lame (laughs) oh your snow came to life how fun is that i'll i mean also kids and then his ass melts he's gonna abandon you at the end of the day because his ass is gonna melt and he is completely disrespectful to an officer of the law who's trying to direct traffic he marches out into a busy street and leads children Along with them. Yeah, takes the children from their homes. Yeah, Frosty is an asshole. (laughs) Could have whipped that sun out even sooner and melted his ass away. Is, uh, and by the way, the Grinch has 100% of Rotten Tomatoes. Is the Grinch on your list, this version of the Grinch? No, he's not. What? All this raving you've done about the Grinch and you... I love it. Is any version of the Grinch on your list? No. Are you trying to guess one of my lists right now? Yeah. Might be time for another clue. So, you guessed Christmas Vacation. We got Elf and Die Hard. So, there's two more. Let's see. Uh, Both of them were released in the 80s. One of them is rated R. One of them is rated, I believe, PG-13. Are they comedies? Uh, One is a comedy. The other is not, it has comedic elements, but is not a comedy. I'm drawing blanks here. One of them you probably, you may not agree is a Christmas film. Similar to the reasons why people think Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. It takes place at Christmas. It was written by a writer who is famous for uh, setting his films at Christmas time. Uh, one of the movies he wrote and set at Christmas time was Iron Man 3. Is Iron Man 3 based around Christmas? Iron Man 3 takes place at Christmas time. The writer in question is, is Shane Black and... I don't... Uh, I need more hints. I'm just not getting it. Okay, let's focus on this one we've been talking about. Written by Shane Black, came out in the 80s. It is not a comedy. Not billed as a comedy, although it has comedic elements. It has an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes. It was not released globally, so it brought in $120 million domestically. It is, at its core, the story of a broken man finding new meaning in life through friendship and family. It contains boobies. The boobies can be seen probably less than five minutes into the film. It kicked off an action movie franchise. It stars... um, I clearly have not seen this. Gary Busey is in it. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Uh, You probably haven't seen it. The movie is Lethal Weapon. Oh, shit. Have you seen Lethal Weapon? No. You piece of shit. Lethal Weapon uh, takes place at at Christmas time. There are Christmas decorations featured in some of the very first scenes, which also feature those boobies. Uh, And then one of the next scenes is... uh, Are they elf boobies? No. They're Amanda Hunsucker's um, (laughs) young pornographic actress ODing on drugs boobies. And the next scene is uh, Mel Gibson's character, Martin Riggs, pretending to purchase a Christmas tree at a lot uh, where he busts drug dealers, cocaine dealers. Anyway, I love this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, I've strongly considered it a Christmas movie and uh, I'm going to watch it before Christmas this year. It, nothing gets me in the holiday spirit like watching Mel Gibson get Gary Busey in a leg lock in the rain Surrounded by cops pointing their guns at them. I thought Lethal Weapon was a comedy. Uh, like I said, it has comedic elements. Do the, do uh, the sequels go more in the comedy route? Lethal Weapon 4 has more comedy. Le- oh, I'm sorry, Lethal Weapon 3 has more comedy and Lethal Weapon 4 is heavily comedy. But Lethal Weapon 1 is more heavily geared towards action. Lethal Weapon 2, I think, is actually the darkest of the series, uh, although they all have great comedic moments did you see daddy's home too i didn't but as soon as i saw mel gibson was in it i wanted to see it yeah i I watched it for the first time within a few weeks ago was mel gibson good in it Uh, i actually didn't like him in it and i'm a huge mel gibson fan like yourself i guess i'm not huge enough to have seen lethal weapon but it's lethal weapon is currently on netflix uh if you haven't out there seen lethal weapon 
do yourself a favor because if you like action movies, most action movies, most action movies today owe everything they have to Lethal Weapon and Die Hard. And The Grinch. I thought Mel Gibson came off unlikable in Daddy's Home too, which may have been the point, but you didn't get the Mel Gibson. Charming. Yeah. He is a charming son of a bitch. Yeah, but maybe that's just me. Uh, John Lithgow in that movie though was, he stole the show. Love me some John Lithgow. I'm, I need a Christmas movie with John Lithgow in it. Well, Pet Cemetery is not Christmas, but it's coming soon. <laughs> I can't wait. Is Roger Rabbit on your list? No, it's not. A, I, if, I don't think any of it takes place at Christmas, no. Well, I wouldn't put it past you to still put it on your list. Is Star Wars yeah. on your list? Same reason. No. Are you still guessing? Where It's not my turn. Oh, uh, okay. Go ahead. <sighs> hmm. One of these I don't think you're going to guess and one of them I'm surprised you haven't guessed. And there, you're not doing any of this uh, stuff where if something's on my list, you'll tell me if it's also on your list, Yeah, right? these two are not on your list. Well, I'm afraid to guess one of the ones. My, the last one that's on my list, I'm afraid to guess it. I think it... No, I know it's not. No, because it, neither of mine take place in the 80s. Hmm. Is Jingle All the Way on your list? No. How about Home Alone? Can you be more specific? Home Alone 2? Home Alone 2, Lost in New York <laughs> is on my list. The sequel rather than the original? I want to talk about that. I want to talk okay. about that. This is in my notes. Let me go. I don't, hey, sequels can, all, can, can definitely be better than originals. Let me, let me read some notes here and then we'll talk about that. So, Home Alone 2 came out in 90... I forgot to put the year. Is it 92? Yeah, it is 92. Okay. Has a global box office of 359 million. <laughs> I wonder why they made another. A Rotten Tomato score is 30%. I'm going to come oh. back to that. All right. The story, the movie is about Kevin, played by Macaulay Culkin, the kid, yeah. and his family decide to take a trip to Florida, but Kevin takes the wrong plane and ends up in New York City. He tries to make do with what he has, such as using his father's credit card. <laughs> Man, he really had to make do uh, yeah. at the Plaza Hotel, but is soon confronted by the wet bandits who return from the first film and must outrun and outprank them again. They became the sticky bandits. Yeah, you're right. The film became the second most financially successful film of 1992 and the film is also notable for featuring a cameo from the future U.S. President Donald Trump who had owned the Plaza Hotel at the time of the film's production. I've, I've heard uh, stories about... If you want to use the word plump a third time in this episode, <laughs> now's the time. I've heard stories about how demanding his plump ass was for the day that he was on the set. Really? Yeah, I guess like that's part of the thing. Like if you want to film, wanted to film at one of Trump's properties, he would like try to get in your movie. <laughs> he would say, yeah, you can do it for this amount of money plus a cameo. <laughs> and I, that was part of the deal. And then of course, I'm sure when he showed up, he acted like a royal dickhead. He can't keep from acting like a dickhead on the world stage. I don't know why he would <laughs> control that on a movie set. His cameo is what? 30 seconds at, at most? Doesn't he just point Kevin in the right... It's less than, it's less than 10 seconds. It's just part of, his, part of his bullshit, man. Sorry if you're a big Trump supporter and you listen to this and now you're all turned off. But I don't think you're listening to this by now. If you're like, I can't, I can't keep it down anymore. It's like bile. Uh, it's got to come out. Home Alone 2 did not gross as highly as Home Alone 1, which grossed almost $500 million. And that surprised me because I hadn't looked this up before today. I always thought that Home Alone 2 was the best and I always thought that everyone thought that. I thought like Home Alone 2 was like agreed, oh, that's the best Home Alone. But it did less at the box office and it has a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes compared to 63 yeah. for the original. Home Alone 3, which no one ever talks about, also got a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. Start a different kid though, right? Yeah, a different kid. So, I, I've spent my whole life living a lie because I thought Home Alone 2 was the understood, superior, more popular film, but it's not. Oh, well... And I like Home Alone 1, but I've always preferred the sequel. If you are into the elaborate um, mousetrap style traps and stuff, Home Alone 2 has some really fun ones. And I was super into the talk boy. I got a talk boy after that movie. I yeah. was dying to get one. And uh, the talk boy, it was, I guess it was an ad for the talk boy because I'd never seen it until that movie. And then... I've, is it literally just a voice recorder? Like that's the extent of its 
I mean, yeah, it's a, it's just a tape recorder, but and it was a cool toy. That was one of the coolest toys I think I ever had. Uh, I don't think I ever had one, but I always wanted one. So yeah, Home Alone 2, it's on my list. Um, so I have one okay. left for you. It's in the you 80s. Have, it's a comedy. It is a comedy. It stars a comedy legend, maybe the greatest living comedy legend. It is one of Robert Mitchum's last films. Is that a director? Robert Mitchum. Uh, now, Robert Mitchum is a famous actor from the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Some of the co-stars in the movie who are great in it are Bobcat Goldthwait. And <gasps> oh, yeah, Bobcat Goldthwait. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't help you? There's only one. I don't know who the hell that is. You don't know who Bobcat is? You would recognize him. Let's look his ass up. I don't know this guy. He is a comedian from the 80s. He was in a lot of Police Academy movies. He's a co-star in that movie. He's very funny. Karen Allen, who played Marion in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, plays the love interest in the movie, and she was fantastic in it. Okay, so I'm looking at Bobcat's filmography. Is it Scrooged? It's Scrooged, starring Bill Murray. I've never heard anyone talk about that movie in my You've life. You've never? I'm aware this movie exists, but that's, I've never heard one person in my entire life until that right now ever bring up this movie. Uh, if, if you're a Bill Murray fan and you've never seen Scrooge, you ought to kick yourself in the balls because it is, it's one of his funniest movies. It's based on the um, Scrooge story, but with Bill Murray. I, I don't know what else can be said about it. It's just... It's extremely funny, and I watch it uh, almost every almost every year. Uh, what about box office Rotten Tomatoes? Oh yeah, you mean the facts? So it did sixty million at the domestic box office. It has a seventy percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's the Robert, like I said, it's Robert Mitchum's last film. And if you ever, in, if you you enjoyed Robert Mitchum from any of his westerns or from the movie Cape Fear, the original Cape Fear, then you would also. Uh, enjoy Robert Minchin yelling the word butthead and kicking a cat. Well, I don't support animal violence, so I don't know if I'd like it. It was faked. You have the same problem my wife does. They don't hurt a mo an animal in the movie. They just fake it. It makes me sad. Well, okay. I'm trying to tell you how to feel. <sighs> okay. You got one left on mine. I'm not cheating. I'm Googling Christmas movies. I'm going to look at this list. I need some... Do you want a hint? I'll give you no. a hint. No. Uh, I don't think it's Gremlins. I don't think it's the Polar Express. It's not... Is it Bad Santa? Bad Santa is my choice. Aha. Uh -huh. Have you seen Bad Santa? Bad Santa was one of the first Blu-rays I ever purchased. Well, everyone store that fact away because, I mean, I'm sure that's a, that's a cocktail party uh, icebreaker. Brandon... One of his first Blu-rays was Bad Santa back in 2003. Bad Santa had a box office of 77 million, almost. A sequel came out in 2016, which I did not see because it was a box office and critical failure. Bad Santa stars Billy Bob Thornton as a bad Santa, as a bad Santa like a Santa at a mall. It also has appearances from Bernie Mac, who I love, John Ritter, who I love. This was yes. John Ritter's last film appearance before his death. That's that same sad. Year. Yeah. That's John Ritter's death is the worst thing to happen on September 11th. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll no comment on that. Uh, but John Ritter, uh, yeah, I was reading about his death when I was doing my research. He was on the set. He was only 54 and he just started having heart pain and then he just died that day. Like they took him to the hospital. He had some condition, I forget, and he died within a day. That guy was damn funny. Love me some Three's Company. Uh, and wasn't John Ritter Batman at some point? I would, I would have. Just kidding. If they made a campy 1960s style Batman in the 90s but starring John Ritter, oh, God, that would have been incredible. Yeah. All right. So, that's our list. Brandon. Yeah. I'm going to guess the order of your top five. I'm going to get it right too. I right. can guarantee you you're not. But let's see. Now, are you judging this on the scale of Christmas or on the scale of just overall movies? How much? No, how much I enjoy it. Okay. Number five is Christmas Vacation. That's right. Number four is Elf. That's right. Number three is Scrooged. That's right. Number two is Die Hard. Yep. Number one is Lethal Weapon. Wow. Great work. Look at that. 
You're just so All predictable. Right. So let me put yours. So Santa Claus was on your list. Santa Claus, Bad Santa, Home Alone 2, Elf, Dr. Seuss. Okay. So I'm, this is difficult. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to do poorly at this. Yep. Starting at number five, I'm going to say Santa Claus. No. The Grinch? No. You're just going to have to tell me the order. I, there's no way I'm going to get this. At least tell me what you think my number one is. Number one, I was going to guess Elf. No. Here's my order. Starting at five. Bad Santa, the Santa Claus, Elf, Grinch, Home Alone 2 is my favorite. <laughs> it's number one. I've always had a soft spot for Home Alone 2 and I, hey, thought, I, I thought I wasn't alone but apparently I am. I mean, I have a soft spot for it too. I guess my spot is not as soft as yours but I don't have <sighs> like... I. I have a hard time judging someone for a movie that they love. I don't give a shit like what you're reasoning for. It. That's cool. But My favorite movie ever is Gilgi starring uh, Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. I think it's called Gigli. <laughs> it's definitely... Giggly? <laughs> Gigli? Giggly? Jiggly? Yeah, that's it. Jiggly. And by the way, don't ever, ever mention how soft your spots are ever again. How did you know that Lethal Weapon was number one and not Die Hard? Because... I know you. I mean... Weapons, it's because it's got more boobies. I, I remember being in like second or third grade and when the other kids were on the playground playing Ninja Turtles, <laughs> I was pretending to be Martin Riggs from Lethal Weapon. <laughs> I specifically asked to wear boots because those are the kind of shoes that uh, Martin Riggs wore. I was guest on. <laughs> because you wanted to be like big and buff and drink eating all the eggs all the ale too so this was fun huh yeah this was like i said this was the i was the most excited to 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 work on this yeah we all wrote that down earlier so you don't need to repeat it uh before we close out i'm going to uh do something that we forgot to do last week mm -hmm. and that is read some of our apple podcast slash itunes reviews first up uh, this is uh, from Steph from the Game Tell 5 podcast. She said that our show is super original and fun. Brandon and Nick make interesting lists, even more inter entertaining, with lots of knowledge and funny stuff. These guys will keep you laughing and intrigued, even Brandon. <laughs> she didn't write that. Maybe. Thank you. And then uh, one more here that we'll read because we love to pat ourselves on the fucking back. Mm-hmm. I prefer to call it 69ing ourselves. Check out the username for this review. I have to just spell it because I can't read it. But actually, I'll try to say it first. Hajdodosjigabs. H H J D O S J D I X B. This is just some, like someone just fluttered their fingers across the keyboard to make it. Or maybe they're foreign and you just offended the fuck out of them. Oh, wow. They say, fun podcast. Being from Memphis, I gotta say, I hate Brandon. <laughs> However, Nick is great enough to still give the show five stars. I can't wait to hear the next episode. Cool. Shout out to Memphis. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, whatever you call it, if you leave us a review, we will read it on air no matter what it says. You could say whatever you want about Brandon and I'll still read it. Search for 10-ish podcast on Apple Podcasts. You have that app on your iPhone even if you don't use it. Write us a review. Rate us five stars. Brandon, we will be back next week with our traditional tennis list for all you tennis podcast purists out there that are scoffing at us for using our opinions on this episode. I would say none of these lists are traditional, but yeah, we'll be back to normal. You have the list next time. Got it. Thanks for listening, everybody, and Merry... It's going to all be about Mel Gibson. Hey, I'd do it. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays from your friends at the Tennis Podcast. Bye. Bye. I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod for his song Hackbeat, which we found on Incompetech.com for the official Tennis Podcast theme. <laughs>